So just a reminder that this kid here, this kid right now basically grinding up against Yamato's butt, he's, he's one of the most important characters in the entire series. A lot rides on him whilst he's riding on him. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece, and today we have a review of chapter 1006, which all in all was a pretty fun catch up of all of the lower level stuff happening right now on Onigashima. Mostly centered around the performance floor of the Skull Dome, there was a very interesting pattern in that most of the characters featured in this chapter are either already there or can converging very closely to that very location. So even though it may seem like a random scattering of catch up scenes here and there, there is a general thread here, I think. Which is good because to be honest, chapters like this, uh, they can be a bit difficult. The ones that focus on pretty much just raw action as well as the secondary and even arguably tertiary characters. To which I'm very specifically referring to Hilgoro and we will get to him, but there was plenty to grab onto. And speaking of uh, grabbing on, we'll start with that Yamato segment, eh? This is probably my least favorite group to be following on Onigashima right now. I mean, I do quite like Yamato and Shinobu and even Momonosuke, he has, uh, he's grown on me. But this feels like the group with no real mission. I get that the idea is to protect Momonosuke because he's the chosen one and everything. Gonna bring about that new dawn and stuff. Hmm. So just a reminder that this kid here, this kid right now basically grinding up against Yamato's butt, he's, he's one of the most important characters in the entire series. A lot rides on him whilst he's riding on him. But basically they're just running and that's all there really is to them right now. There's no goal destination or like a person to reach. It's just a giant game of uh, keep away really. So I feel that very little, if any, progress gets made when we see their actions. However, I do think that this was definitely more of a setup for Sanji. And to jump quickly to Sanji, I am pretty much 100% convinced that Sanji has chosen to go downstairs in order to find Momonosuke. It's just very hard for me to see a situation where Oda carefully crafts this whole interaction of Sanji discovering this information just for him to immediately abandon that idea and then continue upwards to Kinemon. Which is quite unfortunate for the whole Sanji potentially taking on Jack idea. I did very much like that. But it does bring up a whole lot of other potential though. Like I said before, most of this chapter seems to be focusing in on that performance floor, which is very vaguely near the area of the Forbidden Storeroom and happens to be where King, Queen, and now even Perispero are. And while it's nice that we have Drake and Hyogoro there holding the fort alongside Mr. Marco, it could definitely probably use some extra Sanji-infused power. So this perpetual game of who Sanji is going to face will continue. But once again, I will say that I think there's a lot more potential for cool Sanji moments heading in Yamato's direction than I think there is continuing in Jack's direction upstairs. You know what would be really cool? If Sanji made a decision. He's kind of like me trying to write videos, but getting distracted by very shiny objects. Ooh. Speaking of getting distracted, this video is actually sponsored by the Kingsguard Project, a funky YouTube channel designed to chronicle one man's quest to become a real life superhero. And as part of that, he recently made a video where he lit his feet on fire, I repeat, lit his feet on fire in order to mimic Sanji's Diablo Jamba technique. And it looks like he did it in his living room as well, which is a, uh, <laughs> it's a bold choice, sir. But I do wish you the best of luck on your journey and you guys can turn fantasy into reality by checking out the Kingsguard Project through a link in the description below. But it's getting to that point where I really do wish that Sanji just had, you know, one solid direction. It's at the point where his focus seems to change every couple of chapters. You know, at first he was fighting on the performance floor, then he was escorting Luffy to the roof, then he went to save a woman and got trapped, then started heading back up to the roof, and now it looks like he's heading right back down to the performance floor, which is exactly where he started. And just the idea of mapping out Sanji's pathing during this raid is quite an exhausting thought. Something very interesting to think about, however, is that Sanji does not know Yamato. That was one of those fun, oh yeah, moments because we've all known Yamato for what, like a year now? But within the story, Yamato actually hasn't met many of our characters aside from Luffy, Shinobu, Momo, and Frankie, I think. That's it. I might be wrong, I'm sometimes wrong, wrong is me. But Sanji is probably one of the more interesting figures to stumble upon due to a bit of a clash of ideals. Sanji with his whole chivalry business and Yamato currently identifying as a man. A very specific man, but still. So it makes me wonder how that interaction would go down though. But at the same time, I think we'd almost be guaranteed to get that Momonosuke gag I talked about in the last review. I just have this incredibly strong feeling. I think I stated that either Sanji or Brooke would catch him within Yamato's clothing and get all jelly whilst Momo makes his momo sleazy face. I would definitely bet on that exact scenario occurring at this stage. So if you're a Sanji fan who doesn't like him being in a clown around, or someone like me who was hoping that momo gags would perhaps come to an end, at least during the raid, I wouldn't bet on it. Oh, it's gonna happen, isn't it? Sanji's gonna see momo, he's gonna do the jealous eyes and he's just 
just gonna lament that he is not the one within Yamato's clothes. Elsewhere in Onigashima, we also got to catch up with Carrot and Wanda versus Perispero, and well, that's already over. Quite a close call though, allegedly. It would seem that Perispero is quite beloved by fate, having survived both Pedro's suicide explosion and a full on assault from two Sulong Minks, which is very notable because two is more than one. But it makes me really interested to see what Oda's plans for Perispero are, because as the Carrot fight started, I thought that this was going to be his whole jam. Like he was brought here very specifically in order for Carrot to exact revenge and bring this whole Pedro thing full circle. And to be fair, I suppose that may still happen. I'm sure that that moon will pop out again, say hello eventually. But Perispero is just such a cool wild card in this raid. He has no allegiance to the Beast Pirates nor the Allied Forces, so he holds a lot of that lovely chaotic potential. At any given moment, Perispero could be used against anyone or anything. And I really like having that more random factor involved. But I'm also quite curious to know how people feel about the Perispero carrot fight being conducted off screen. I personally hold the stance that I usually have. I don't really care. In fact, I think it might have definitely been for the better. It's the smaller scale battles like this that would really severely throttle the series if we had to explore each and every one of them. So I'm pretty satisfied with just seeing that cool opening exchange and then cutting to the outcome. I guess it gives the anime something to play with in the future if they need some film material. And I think we all know that they most certainly will. Just like you will most certainly need to subscribe to the Grand Line Review, which will result in consistent injections of One Piece culture being uploaded straight into your YouTube feed. Please make sure not to off screen your pressing of this button. Also in this chapter, absolutely brilliant Perispero moment, which was when he was lifting up Carrot by the neck. Very, very small thing here, but I like the deliberate choice to have Perispero lift Carrot up with his prosthetic arm. Oh, Perispero is holding Carrot with his, uh, his candy hand. Candy handy, if you will. Although actually just having thought about that a bit further, well, maybe we probably shouldn't. But I love it because it's just such a vengeful thing to do. There's this whole feel of, look what you did to me. This is the arm that your precious Pedro stole from me, and now it's being used to utterly humiliate you. It was a great character moment, and Perispero is just such an awful, yet surprisingly captivating dude, bro. With every subsequent chapter he appears in, I feel that both my like and disgust levels for him go up completely in tandem. Especially because he's not entirely wrong in his thinking either. Pedro and Carrot were the ones who invaded their territory. Like, did you really really, really expect to stroll on into the base of an Emperor of the Sea and just not face any consequences? I mean, maybe Carrot actually did. She's all young and innocent after all. But what do you do if you're Perispero? Just let them do and steal and fight and destroy whatever they want? But this brings us properly to the performance floor where we have two main points of interest. The first of which is a pineapple named Marco. And I think that he is something of a savior of this chapter. Having gone and said that I'm all right with skipping Carrot's action, I did very much enjoy seeing Marco single-handedly holding off both King and Queen, but having those single hands being simultaneously quite full. Mostly because I love seeing Marco's Phoenix powers on page. They're very eye-catching, the way in which Oda draws these specific flames. And there was also some great choreography where King sliced through one of Marco's wings and just Marco conjuring that cool flame attack. Lots of generally enjoyable stuff that happens with upper fights like this, but probably wouldn't have happened with something like Carrot versus Perispero. Also, Queen, what are you doing, mate? Did you just shoot a... Has he always been able to do that? Just like shoot a beam out of his mouth? Like a, a queen beam? Queen is a stupidly interesting figure. I mean, there was that one panel in chapter 999 where he just had a gun pop out of his mouth, which was weird and fun. But this is some full on pacifista stuff now, which is kind of mind boggling because it's one thing to modify your body. But when you really think about it, Queen needs to modify two bodies because how does he keep everything in check when Queen has to consistently switch back between his human and beast forms? Like what happens to to these huge guns when Queen reverts back to his small but still kind of huge human form. Is that why he's so massive? Because he's just stuffed himself with weapons? Whatever the case, I like it. A dinosaur shooting a laser beam is pretty much everything that my child self was looking for in life, so sure, give me more of the Queen beam. But as for our main focus of the chapter, we do come to Hyogoro. So this was something that I noticed, but quite frankly, couldn't be bothered to talk about in the last chapter review. But Hyogoro did indeed resume his more chunk form in chapter 1005. And I I assumed it was some sort of invocation of Seimeki Khan, which is life return, or the same sort of thing that Lao Ji did on Dress Rosa. I think that was called Geoken or Geofist in English, but it was a martial arts style that amongst other things allowed him to somehow literally conserve and store muscle power from his youth in order to call upon it in his old age. Quite a cool idea actually, and I do wish we'd gotten to see a bit more of it. The Hyogoro situation is quite different though. It's nothing that he seems to have really done on purpose, more the results of being infected by Queen's ice demon shenaniganry. But Hyogoro serves as 
the key thread of this chapter, which is potentially problematic to me because it requires me to care about him in any way for that to work. And look, harsh personal truth here, I just don't feel strongly in any way about Hyogoro. He's a kind of cool old man guy, but I know very little about him and I have even less of a connection to the Yakuza dude bros that he is admittedly beautifully asking to end his life for him. What I will say is it would be interesting if he died though, having earlier stated that you really shouldn't expect a waltz into the territory of an emperor and come out unscathed, while well, Hyogoro would serve as a good Pedro towards that idea. And when you think about it, Wano is actually going very, very well at the moment, despite the fact that we are dealing with double emperors. Surely someone's got to permanently go down at some stage. And an actual casualty would probably help that feeling of desperation to emerge, but I just don't know if that's what's going to happen here because oh, it's one piece. And we could easily open up on chapter 1007 with Chopper finishing the antidote, saving his life and making this more or less, you know, false drama. I wish I cared more about Hyogoro, but I just don't. And look, it is a sweet moment. There's definitely a somber feeling attached to seeing this old man look back on his life as well as appreciate the future, whether he's in it or not. I just don't think that we, or I guess I should more accurately say me, know enough about Hyogoro for this to really hit hard. Let me know if it does hit with you guys though. I'm very curious to hear what you all think of it. But some pretty cool stuff happened with chapter 1006 outside of the chapter as well. Firstly, One Piece was on the cover of Weekly Shonen Jump and oh, it's a pretty damn cool cover. A truly superb shot of the monster tree of the worst generation very much echoing the whole when you're at sea, you fight against pirates scene. And this is a cover that I really want to pick up actually. I've had to force myself to stop collecting jumps years and years ago actually, because they're pretty massive and they just take up far too much space, but I may very well need to make an exception because that's not all. We also have one of the most interesting color spreads I think this series may have ever seen. This is a full on image of the top players of the beast pirates, which is pretty wild because I think this may be the first time we've had a color spread in the series that features no straw hats whatsoever. I might be wrong in that, but I can't think of any other off the top of my head, even the promotional one for Film Z, which featured every Marine in the series to that point, it still had the straw hats in it. I do really like it though, especially getting to see the Toby Ropo because it's still quite a novelty to have them in color. I always forget that Who's Who has this crimson red scheme going on and he definitely has my favorite design of the six. Ah, so Who's Who is literally Satan. And just on a minor artistic note, I've pointed this out using a similar spread on this channel before, but this is a very basic but effective technique. Just observe the gaze of all of the characters. Kaido and King are acting as the central pillar of the spread looking right at you, but the characters to their left and to their right are either looking or facing in their respective directions, which is a major aspect of why this image is so well balanced and a pure pleasure to look at. It's also a legitimately fantastic color spread and it makes me wish that we got more like these for the other antagonistic crews. But if you are interested in some more antagonistic emperor action, then please do check out this video which ranks each one of our glorious emperors. Plenty of Kaido, so I look forward to seeing you there.